We've seen nearly half a billion dollars of net inflows into digital investments since BlackRock submitted an application for a spot Bitcoin ETF. Is this the watershed event that brings crypto into the mainstream? What happens when the first spot Bitcoin ETF is approved? And what if they fail? Joining us now is Josh Frank, co-founder and CEO of The Thai, a leading provider of information services for digital assets and makers of The Thai Terminal a comprehensive digital assets workstation for institutional investors. Josh, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure to have you. So uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. We've had a lot of uh, a lot of activity in the last few weeks. Uh, we, we'd like to hear what you're hearing from ETF issuers and institutional investors about the Bitcoin ETFs. We'd, we'll also go over uh, some of the different potential scenarios that could play out here. But first, uh, as someone who's immersed in the institutional side of digital assets, what was your reaction when you heard the news about BlackRock? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think there are multiple different reactions. The first is I've known the BlackRock crypto team for a while. They've been around for a while, and I think it's gotten mixed in the sh or lost in the shuffle all the different things that they're doing. Right, Aladdin, you know, Aladdin, you know, the portfolio management system manages hundreds of trillions of dollars in assets, has the hundred largest you know, uh, institutional investors in the world using it. BlackRock had already previously announced they partnered with Coinbase and they were going to offer Bitcoin buying and selling uh, and crypto trading through Aladdin. So that was already public, you know, a year or so prior, if not if not more than that. Uh, and so the news that BlackRock was filing for an ETF for me, I, I, I would say isn't wasn't totally shocking, but I think it couldn't have been better timing. And I think it was... It happened when the industry needed it most, when Gary Gensler kind of had crypto on its knees with all of the lawsuits against uh, against uh, Binance and against Coinbase. So I think the timing surprised me a little bit. I think the fact that as Gensler was taking such a harsh stance on crypto, that BlackRock would come out that publicly and do something like that. I think maybe the timing of it was a little bit surprising, pleasantly surprising to me. But the fact that it happened, I mean, I think validates what a lot of people have been saying for for a while which is that the institutions are coming because you know they they are starting to come and, and we can get into what that actually means but 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 um you know blackrock has had a dedicated crypto team already right and this is interesting as well because there's no way blackrock is doing this as a favor to the crypto industry i mean blackrock is is in is is invested in years and years of due diligence and years and years of building out uh, building out the infrastructure, building out the relationships, engaging the interest of their own clients and the broader market. So when they're announcing this type, when they're submitting this type of application in this type of uh, market environment, it means they're essentially saying that regardless of how harsh the SEC is and regardless of how down crypto is, uh, they think now's the time and they're uh, they're ready to move. Is that is that a big vote of confidence for the broader crypto industry or or just for Bitcoin? Well, I think I think it's a, a vote of confidence for the broader crypto industry in that they're choosing a crypto partner. They're choosing Coinbase as their their exchange uh, uh, in custody partner for the product. So I think that is a really big vote of confidence. Right. Coinbase is the only publicly traded crypto exchange. Um, and, and they're partnering with them for more than just Bitcoin buying and selling on Aladdin. They're doing other things in crypto. Uh, and a large number of asset managers beyond just BlackRock are looking at tokenization and using these assets for a number of different use cases. So I think I think it's I think it is a vote of confidence for crypto. Obviously, this is Bitcoin, right? And so we should be clear this is not an Ethereum ETF, it's not anything else. But you have to start somewhere and you have to start with Bitcoin. So I think that's a really big vote of confidence. And I think to your point, uh, a point which is missed is that. BlackRock would not be doing this unless they had demand from existing clients, right? They must have clients that are asking BlackRock to be able to get exposure to, to a Bitcoin ETF. Uh, and they must have a view that there will be some number of billions of dollars, if not tens or hundreds of billions of dollars in inflows into this product to justify the effort uh, that's gone into this filing, into launching you know, the ETF. And you know, to Larry Fink is not going out publicly and talking about this. Unless he, you know, he has some bullish outlook that it's going to be driving revenue into BlackRock, right? And uh, and BlackRock, BlackRock is kind of a leading indicator. BlackRock is is such a major player in the markets. You're also uh, very plugged in to more than more than most institutions. You're you're more plugged into the institutional side of digital assets in particular. So, what are you hearing from from ETF people? What are you hearing? on the demand side or on the sentiment side from institutional investors that you speak to? 
Yeah, I mean, institutional investors, you know, is such a broad word. It means so many different things. And it means so like to crypto people, institutional investors two years ago meant a family office that was buying crypto, right? Now we're talking, when we're talking about institutional investors, we're talking about large asset managers. But I think you have to kind of split, split it out, right? I mean, you have your hedge funds, you have your asset managers, and you have your allocators. Let's start there, right? From from a, from a, from kind of the broader lens, right? On the asset manager side, that's where we're starting to see a lot of traction action around crypto. We saw obviously the BlackRock filing, but there's also a filing by Fidelity. There's also a filing by Van Eck and a number of other asset managers as well. They're obviously taking this ETF race seriously. They are trying to get in. Uh, and they must be seeing demand from from their clients. And the thing to remember is that generally speaking, first mover advantage is massively important on an ETF, right? Whoever gets there out there first, like BitO did with the Bitcoin futures ETF, tends to see a large number of inflows, and then it becomes a race to the bottom on fees, right? If you can get the first ETF approved, you'll see a large inflow, even if your fees are relatively higher. And then everyone who kind of files follows behind that you know, is kind of competing on fees. And then maybe the second or third mover who has a lower fee product ends, ends up seeing some of that moving. But really, people want to come in first to capture the fees. So I think you'll continue to see a large number of people filing and want to get in on the ground floor. Because if you think even there's some marginal opportunity here, BlackRock's kind of de-risked you by going first. So you can follow second or third or fourth or fifth or sixth. Um, but in terms of where the demand is, you know, one of the biggest barriers to institutional adoption uh, for years has been the lack of service providers, right? If you go and you speak to a hedge fund, for example, they're like, well, who do I do business with? Who do I custody with? Who do I trade with? Who are my counterparties? Who do I feel comfortable with? When FTX collapsed, that really shattered a lot of trust that the crypto industry had built, right? A lot of institutions started to use FTX, were taking it seriously, had invested. Remember, BlackRock was an investor in FTX, as was Tomothic, the Singaporean government, as was a number of other sovereign wealth funds and large institutional investors, right? And so that kind of shattered a lot of trust. And as a large hedge fund, right, think a $50 billion hedge fund in the US, right, they're going out and they're looking like, well, where can I trade, right? Like if I'm taking outside investor capital, in some cases, I'm a hedge fund, I might be bearing, I might, I might be managing a, a charity's capital. I might be managing firefighters' retirement money, right? That Those are real people. That's real money that I don't want to lose. Right. As I think about moving into crypto, I want to make sure that I have a really robust risk management strategy for getting exposure to the space. Right. And they look at the space now and they're like, OK, well, I feel relatively confident about Coinbase. But beyond that, where else can I trade? Right. Where do I feel confident custodying my money? And what we've seen is on the custody side, Boney Mellon has built out an entire custody uh, offering for crypto. State Street is also. But the problem is some SEC regulation that's come in place. Uh, you know, in particular, a ruling called SAB 121, which basically means that for a crypto, for a, for a traditional bank to custody digital assets, they need to hold an equal amount of U.S. dollar collateral for their crypto. And what that means is that you're foregoing treasury yield to, you know, earn, let's say, 50 or 30 basis points custodying crypto. So it's made it impossible for those large traditional banks to custody crypto right now. So these funds are being left with choices, which are crypto native service providers that maybe only have 20 or 30 or 40 or $50 million in their balance sheet. And that's a huge problem. So what the ETF filing does is now all of a sudden, maybe these guys do want to go into crypto and they are going to trade spot crypto on exchanges at a later point in time, but they're still waiting for the market to mature. They're still waiting for more service providers. These guys are really excited to be able to tra trade an ETF and an iShares BlackRock ETF is going to be incredibly liquid, right? So I, th I think it's a, it's a really big opportunity. And I think a, a lot of these organizations have built out crypto teams that are ready to go. But from a compliance perspective, they can't get the buy in yet to interf interface for, for some of the reasons that I just you know laid out with crypto. And I think you know that's probably where a lot of the demand that BlackRock is seeing is coming from. And I think a lot of these crypto teams are gonna be able to push their organizations to go into crypto. And I think the same thing goes with sovereign wealth funds as well. And large asset managers, I see. I think you see them, and in, in not in, in within a week or a day, but over months and years, starting to allocate directly through, you know, through through whether it be the BlackRock product or another ETF that you know may or may not get through. All right. Now, so that's a that's a pretty good overview of the demand side. Um, but let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the internal the internal views at the SEC. So this is obviously quite opaque. We're not necessarily going to know 
a lot until we get i mean we we had we had this news coming out that the sec didn't formally reject basically just said uh these are inadequate applications without uh surveillance sharing agreements uh the, the partner for the surveillance surveillance sharing agreement being explicitly listed so now we've seen all these refilings uh with coinbase uh, i'm curious first of all how uh, Coinbase obviously is a U.S. exchange, is is registered, and so on. But the SEC has not been very kind to Coinbase in recent months. So, how you know, are these applications potentially hamstrung by all going in with Coinbase? Now, Coinbase may be the best exchange under the circumstances, but uh, if the SEC isn't thrilled with Coinbase at some level. Uh, does that essentially uh, critically flaw all of these applications? I think we need to kind of separate two things out, right? Binance, for example, is being sued for potentially trading with customers' deposits, commingling funds, and things like that, right? Being a bad actor. Coinbase, on the other hand, is being sued for potentially listing unregistered securities, right? And, and that's part of what's listed. Not every asset listed on Coinbase was mentioned. But certainly the SEC has made it pretty clear that anything not Bit named Bitcoin is a security, or that's at least Gensler's. That's definitely not the full belief because Hester Pierce doesn't believe that, right? But but that is Gensler's belief that you know everything not Bitcoin is basically a security. But I think that's separate, right? That doesn't mean that Coinbase as a company doesn't have a buttoned up operation. You know, they're a publicly reported company. They've never had issues with regulators before. They've tried to do the things things the right way, and the SEC hasn't come out and said that Bitcoin is a, is a security. They're saying that Bitcoin's a commodity, right? So I don't think BlackRock would have filed, especially a week after this SEC ruling, unless their lawyers who are significantly more you know uh, tuned in and intelligent than I am had had a, had a had a very good belief that or, or feeling that 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 might not matter. And I think, look, at this point, right, all of these large uh, institutions filing, right? These institutions, like, you know, they have massive sway over the U.S. government, right? At the end of the day, in 08, 09, BlackRock was managing the U.S., you know, the U.S. government's money, right? And so these these, these guys are really tuned in. They have, they have massive sway over the government. I think what could end up happening, and this is a hypothesis, is that maybe Gensler comes out and says, yeah, well, you know, my, my actions against all these securities issuers, because he's taking some, you know, uh, you know, like the, the actions against the issuers directly, the actions against DeFi, which they're now starting to, you know, pop up, the actions against Binance and Coinbase, that's cleaned up the market. And now because of all the actions I took, because of everything I did, he can make this a celebratory parade. Well, now the market is in shape where I could go and approve a BlackRock filing. I think that like, if they're feeling the pressure to approve it, it could be a, it could be spun that way, right? Where where he 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 takes it as a victory lap, right? Meanwhile, BlackRock, of course, is doing what they're doing on their own timetable. So BlackRock uh, filing this is essentially their read of 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 their own their own customers' interest, their read of of the market, their read of the opportunity. But the timing in this case is almost advantageous because it's uh, he can spin it as a uh, Gensler and the SEC can spin it as a, a vindication of this strategy. We shook out all the bad players, all the bad guys are running scared, and now the good guys are ready to step up. I cleaned up, uh, I, I cleaned up Dodge, you know, and now uh, now the good businesses can open up in this space. So I, I can I can see that happening. And and can you explain for our viewers a little bit of the difference between Coinbase acting as the surveillance sharing agreement partner? And Coinbase, because essentially this is BlackRock's resources. What what they're banking on here is BlackRock's uh, market and not Coinbase's market. So what is what exactly is Coinbase providing? What is the SEC judging Coinbase on at, as a, secu- a surveillance sharing agreement partner in these in these applications? Yeah, I think that just means that what they're doing, and, and this exists in traditional markets, right? NASDAQ has a product called Smarts that's monitoring and making sure there's no manipulation on an exchange. I think what they're doing is basically putting in technology in place to basically make sure that these markets are not being manipulated. There's no order book spoofing. There's no front running of trades, right? Making sure, because one of the things that the SEC has argued when they haven't approved these, these uh, ETF filings in the, in the past, and remember, these have been happening for 10 years. 10 years ago, Gemini spent the first ETF filing, right? Or, or the Winklevoss twins did, right? And so, you know, what they've complained about, at least in recent in recent years, is that these markets are prone to manipulation. They're not actively being monitored. And they've approved the CMEs, 
uh, you know, futures ETF based off the CME, which honestly hasn't made any sense because the reference index, which calculates the CME price, uses Coinbase. Coinbase is one of the constituent uh, exchanges, uh, and and the and the and the um, the suggested ETF is also using basically the same exact index that has been approved for the futures ETF. And, and that's been the case, by the way, for years. People continue to basically file with the same index that the CME is using for their ETF. But in this case, what, 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 what's happening is basically BlackRock and Coinbase are coming together uh, and saying, hey, look, we're going to use technology to monitor the market to make sure there's no manipulation. And, and not only will Coinbase view that data, but we will have a surveillance sharing agreement where that data can be brought back and, and shared with BlackRock as well. All right. So so it's really about, uh, so Coinbase is already essentially one of the foundations. Obviously, they're, what is it about 50% of the total uh, Bitcoin market in the United States goes through Coinbase. So in addition to, you know, they're surveilling essentially a lot of their own activity. So they're in a very, very strong position to... to... But they were already doing that. This is a little bit bogus. I mean, they were already had... Surve- they're, they're already making sure there's no manipulation on their exchange. They already had technology in place. Now they're just sharing some of that technology with them. Right. And the SEC and was the already the SEC was already regulating them and watching this for years and years on end. So there, there are no question marks about whether or not this is being done properly on the Coinbase side because they're still regulated, they're still legal. Yeah. All right. So let's uh let's explore some of the possibilities now. What what do you think the impact would be if the BlackRock First of all, I guess before that, before the scenarios, does BlackRock have a better chance of approval? So everyone has has Coinbase as as the as the uh, as the surveillance sharing agreement partner, but these are these are different institutions. There, as you mentioned, there some are more plugged into the U.S. government directly to the regulatory framework than others, and obviously some have deeper pockets and more credibility uh, than others. So, do you believe that BlackRock would be the first to get approved? If uh, if we see these approvals, does BlackRock have a have a big I, edge over the other applicants? In other words, I think I think they're from speaking to ETF experts. So I've spoken to a large number of people that are experts in this field. So this is more passing on information than than my viewpoint. But what I'm what I'm hearing in the market is that generally it's by the date of application. And so I believe originally ARC was a few, you know, had front run maybe by about a month from the filing on BlackRock. And it was, they amended it to include the, uh, they amended it to include the surveillance sharing agreement, the same one that BlackRock had. However, they were both forced to refile. And so I think it's likely that they get approved on the same day. Uh, it's, it, it, there's nothing materially different in the filings. And so the SEC can't go out and pick favorites and choose one over another. And so it's really going to come down to data filing, which is why I said it's really important, you know, to have first mover advantage to get in to actually get the filing in quickly, which is why everyone rushed to file as fast as be possible. I think BlackRock actually refiled on the same day. It just took the CME a couple of days to update their website. But I think BlackRock had filed on the same day, um, you know, once they added just all they needed to add was the word Coinbase, that Coinbase was the partner, right? So uh, my, my understanding is that these ETFs should all get approved very quickly, uh, uh, or, or not not quickly, very closely to one another. If we see BlackRock or we see ARC or we see any of them else get approved, any of the other ones get approved, all of them will get approved. It's just a matter of when their data filing comes. Okay. So now the, now the scenarios. Uh, if Assuming that this works, assuming that the approval happens, uh, what is the impact on the broader crypto market if if these applications get approved? Yeah. So I think, well, the first question is, what are the impact on Bitcoin, right? And the impact is now um, you can hold Bitcoin in your retirement account. That's a really big deal. And financial advisors can recommend Bitcoin. You know, they're recommending an iShares product, just like you have, you know, just like you have an iShares gold product or iShares S&P product or anything else. Now you can have an iShares Bitcoin product. And, you know, look, maybe, you know, the average person decides they want to hold 1% or 2% Bitcoin in, in their retirement account. When you add, you know, that up across all the people in the U.S. that you know that have a retirement account, that becomes a really large number. But right? it also becomes really easy for uh, institutions to get exposure into Bitcoin, right? Whereas I told you a lot of the challenges to actually take direct Bitcoin exposure, now they can get exposure uh, via a liquid ETF and via you know via Black, BlackRock's vehicle or I don't know, maybe it's Vanguard's vehicle or Fidelity's or whatever it is, you know that gets decided as being kind of the, the large player in the space, right? So so that's massively bullish. And but that doesn't play out over a day. That doesn't play out over a week. 
you know, it's not going to take a month for a large asset manager to decide they want to take a $200 million Bitcoin position or a $2 billion Bitcoin or $20 billion or $200 billion Bitcoin position. It's going to take time and it's going to take time to build up in their portfolio, but that's really bullish. So what happens to the rest of crypto? Well, what happens in crypto all the time, and kind of you know, something I like to say, is that when no one's talking about crypto, you kind of want to buy Bitcoin. When everyone's talking about Bitcoin, you kind of want to buy shit coins. When everyone starts talking about shit coins, you want to run. Right. The second your grandma starts talking to you about something that's not Bitcoin, stay as far away from crypto as you possibly can. And I'm I'm joking, right? But that's really kind of how the markets behaved, you know, cyclically over the last six or seven years. Whereas I think what will happen is if bit if the ETF gets approved, I think Bitcoin is going to obviously see a surge because no one is hundred percent confident this is gonna get approved. Everyone is still asking questions, is trying to figure out what happens. So if it does happen, if it does get approved, I think you start to see really big movement in the market. A lot of people get excited. A lot of people kind of, you know, FOMOing into Bitcoin. And then what happens is the average investor looks and they're like, well, Bitcoin just, you know, you know, quadrupled this year, right? It went from, it was down to 16K. Now it's back towards all time highs at 60K. I missed out. Where do I go next? And I think you see a large number of inflows into altcoins if that happens. And that doesn't mean that there's anything fundamentally value about these valuable about these altcoins. I think that's just investors FOMOing into them, right? And there's obviously questions about how valuable some of these things are and aren't. And obviously some of them are valuable. Um, so I think I think that's likely what you'll end up seeing happening. So I think, you know, it's it's to to, to something you said before we started, a rising tide lifts all boats. I think that that's something that will happen. I think, you know, the 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 tide is institutional inflows into Bitcoin you know, brings up the rest of the market. All right. And then what if it's delayed? First of all, how, when are we expecting, when can we expect to get a ruling one way or the other on these applications? They're all obviously clustered very closely together. So when could we be expecting to get the first of the, of the decisions from the SEC? I believe it's September or August is when we can first hear back. Um, I think, I would be surprised, and I'm not an ETF expert, but I would be surprised if it wasn't delayed. Like, I don't think we're going to necessarily get a decision then. Um, but I, I think if it's delayed, maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the market stays range bound. I mean, right now, Bitcoin's realized volatility is basically at the lowest point it's been at in three or four years. Um, you know, the market is really range bound between 30 and $31,000. Because the market has no idea what's going to happen. If the market knew what was going to happen, Bitcoin wouldn't be sitting here completely unvolatile, right? I mean, Bitcoin didn't even react this morning to the inflation, uh, you know, inflation going down. It had no reaction. I mean, it's up 30 basis points, maybe, whereas, you know, futures were up, you know, 100 basis points, you know, uh, before the open of the market. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think I think it just continues to stay range bound if we if we get delayed. I, I don't think anybody's going to be particularly surprised. And what are the nature of these delays? Could this be the SEC coming back to the applicants and saying, now we need this, now we need that, you know, maybe moving the goalposts or maybe just asking them to dot some more I's, cross some more T's? Or is it, could it just literally them, be we them need, simply we need 90 more days. decision? Pardon? It could, I, it, sorry, it could just be we need 90 more days to make a decision, right? It could just be, you know, maybe that gives Gensler enough time to feel like he can take his victory lap. Maybe 90 days after the filing isn't enough time. But if we wait another 90 days, then... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, look, there's no reason it shouldn't get approved, right? The BlackRock has submitted, I don't know, 600 filings in the past, 599 or some number like that have been approved, right? You know, there's a futures ETF that's already approved. You know, you have large asset managers putting their name behind this. There's now surveillance sharing agreements in place. It's using the same exact reference index that was being used to calculate, you know, the CME price, which has a futures index based off of it. So I, I there, there, there's there, even there a leverage. There's even a leveraged one that's been approved. So now we have now we have leveraged Bitcoin yeah, exactly. fund approved, which is which would seem to be kind of jumping ahead of uh, of just a spot Bitcoin uh, ETF. Right. If your goal is to protect investors, you know, and, and you think that crypto markets are manipulated, why would you approve a levered futures ETF when you're not even approving a regular spot ETF that uses the same underlying index to calculate? Right. When the whole problem is volatility and you could lose all your money and very, very scary. And now you have a leveraged one approved. So that's, a, yeah, I, I guess I, it, everything is pointing towards this being a, a safe and a, a reasonable time for these applications to be approved. But now let's uh, let's look at the, the worst case scenario for crypto. What if uh, they get rejected? So again, this could, uh, the argument, I guess, would be that Gensler says, nope, the market's not ready. 
we're not ready to formally give even Bitcoin that that type of imprimeur of saying this is definitely a commodity or this is definitely safe. Uh, he might be the SEC might be concerned that this sends a signal exactly what you're saying that uh, everybody jumps into the broader crypto market because they see the SEC approving these types of financial in instruments for the broader market, the safest possible investments, things for retirements. They might be afraid that this signal, this even if Bitcoin itself, and even if BlackRock and the others' applications are credible and safe, this might just be the wrong signal to markets. What happens to Bitcoin in that scenario? And then obviously what happens with the altcoins on the broader market? Yeah, so I think one thing before we get into that that I forgot to add is the fact that there's an ongoing law lawsuit from Grayscale versus the SEC, right? And and from the initial hearings, the, the the judge has sounded incredibly sympathetic for Grayscale and has 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 at least publicly behaved like the SEC's you know viewpoints on why the ETF, the Grayscale's application, uh, was rejected were were kind of bullshit. Right. And so I think that might also be contributing to why BlackRock was comfortable filing now and why others are comfortable filing, because these have happened quite you know, close to a lot of the grayscale uh, hearings that have happened. So I think that's one thing. And so my point in bringing that up, the question is, why were they rejected? Right. If they were rejected because of some technicality, like they forgot the word Coinbase or something like that on it. Right. I think the markets can have a very different reaction. Then if Gensler comes out publicly and he's like, we're not going to approve one of these things, the market broadly is being manipulated. We're not going to approve it until X and Y and Z happens. I really think it just depends on what what the SEC says, what their reasoning for, for you know, if, if the if the SEC comes out and like totally, you know, part of my friend shits on crypto, right? Like, then I think the market tanks, right? And gets totally destroyed and sells off. And people are like, all right, this isn't getting approved anytime soon. If it's approved for, no matter what, if it's rejected, the market's going to go down at least temporarily. It's just a matter of how severely it goes down, I guess is what I'm trying to say. All right. Now, there are a lot of moving parts here. Uh, as we go forward with this process, what will you be watching to gauge uh, how this could unfold? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things that's been uh, interesting, and I don't think that he has inside information on the ETF filing, but Fred Ursam, who's one of the co-founders of Coinbase, uh, who's now a partner at Paradigm, uh, since May has been buying a ton of Coinbase shares. I think he's bought $120 million worth of Coinbase shares, uh, which you know he probably knew that the filing was going to happen. He probably doesn't know if the filing is even approved. That would be obviously you know, inside information, inside baseball. But I think that, that's really bullish. Um, uh, and ARC I think, has been, I, ARC know, has been buying up uh, Coinbase like crazy as well. Even when everyone's down, and even, even immediate, really. Oh, they sold today. Oh, that's interesting. I think I think or yesterday, Kathy sold like twelve million bucks, like a small number. But yes, but but uh, also, our, we also saw a huge spike up in in uh, in Coinbase's price uh, over this short period of time. So this could be a good time to take profits. They're not exactly uh, backing away from Coinbase. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I mean, it's up ninety percent, ninety percent this month, or ninety percent of the last month, and it's up three hundred percent since since lows this year. So yeah, like this is probably just her profit taking. She's a very long term oriented investor, for better or for worse. Uh, people have their opinions. I mean, I think I'm watching, um, yeah, I, like, watching insider trading on Coinbase shares is, is quite interesting. I also am watching what Larry Fink and BlackRock come out and say publicly. And I'm watching if there are other filings, because if we get close to the deadline and we see more and more filings start to come in, that's probably a good sign. But the other things that I'm looking out for are all the SEC lawsuits that are happening right now, right? The Ripple suit has still not come to uh, any sort of decision. Uh, and that's been, you know, every time I speak to anybody who thinks they know anything about the Ripple case, they tell me this year, this year, this year. Uh, and a lot of that this year was last year. And now we're in July already. So we'll see. Uh, I'm watching that. I'm watching that. And I'm also just watching the volatility of Bitcoin broadly and continued inflows into Bitcoin, right? If if we start to see, you know, volatility increase, we start to see price increase and more inflows come, you know, that might be a positive sign. But at the end of the day, this is Gensler's decision. And uh, like, you can watch everything else you want, but the most important thing to do is watch what Gensler does and what he says and what he decides. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. This has been very illuminating. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm Ernest Hoffman for Kitco News. Keep it here for more expert commentary about what's moving markets. And don't forget to subscribe. Begin your path to financial freedom. 
gain up to a $7,000 bonus on us. Register and use promo code. Deposit and enjoy a 7% bonus. Available now. Link in the description.